poster from the ICUC database on dislocated fractures, we're going to look at the question of whether or not scaphalunate dissociation in association with a fracture of the distal radius is truly a scaphalunate, a traumatic ligament tear, as it might be with a perilunate dislocation, or is it an isolated stretching of the supporting structures to the scaphalunate, including the dorsal capsule, but not truly a complete dissociation and rupture of the scaphalunate ligament. These exhibits are from the database of the ICUC collection of fractures. Uh, these are fractures supplied by a number of centers in Europe and in Uruguay, South America. They represent cases that are uh, not only documented from the preoperative to the postoperative, but also with a preoperative CT scan a number of intraoperative steps are documented surgically and then a post-operative x-ray and CT scan and follow-up. So that all of these cases that are documented in this ICUC, which stands for integrated into a learning tool that's complete, unchanged, and continuous, have this documentation based from start to finish. The background for this particular question is whether or not these are truly scaphalunate traumatic ligament injuries that may go on to long-term arthrosis and clinical problems, or are they uh, associated x-ray findings that may represent some loss of support, but not true ligament injury. We're going to look at four cases, and the first case is uh, one that shows on the x-ray and CT scan what is suggested to be a ligament injury to the scaphalunate. Uh, at surgery, which was an open dorsal approach, uh, the suture is in the dorsal component of the scaphalunate ligament. And at this point, it was felt that this was representative of a traumatic injury and it was fixed in a standard fashion. But is this really a clinical problem? In the second case, we see in the 35-year-old with a uh, radial styloid fracture component and a very wide interval between the scaphoid and lunate, uh, this fracture component eponymically was called a Schoffer's fracture. And we were taught that this is a lesion that could be associated with scaphalunate ligament rupture. Here you see the CT scan, the x-ray, uh, as illustrated here, and with um, computerized bone models uh, in different colors represent the fracture components. The fracture was taken to surgery through an anterior approach and a anatomically shaped implant was uh, used with a nearly anatomic reduction of the fracture yet the scaphalunate widening persists. As we've learned uh, along many years of experience, one should always x-ray the opposite side. And by measurement, this distance between the scaphoid and lunate was equal on both sides. We see in follow-up radiographically at 36 weeks and furthermore at 72 weeks that there has been no change and in the uh, sagittal view, you notice that the scaphalunate uh, alignment appears uh, unchanged as well. And the functional result shows uh, nearly full motion. And um, the ICU score, which shows functional limitation and pain to be only uh, very low findings of one out of four, four being the greatest amount of pain. The third case is again a complex intraarticular fracture with a large uh, a radial and styloid component and a volar displacement as well. And we see a widening between the scaphalunate interval on the CT scan particularly and the anterior posterior x-ray. 
approached through an anterior incision. The fracture was reduced and stabilized with an anatomically shaped plate. And here too, if one had x-rayed the opposite side, you can see that the uh, distance between the scaphoid and lunate was almost equal. Here at 45 weeks, the x-ray shows um, a complete healing and maintenance of a, a normal, in the sagittal view, scaphoid-lunate alignment. And this, the widening persists between the scaphoid and lunate. And if we look at the functional follow-up, both at 16 weeks and at 379 weeks, the patient is pain-free with full functional outcome. And the final case, as illustrated the, this problem, is a wide scaphoid lunate interval in a dorsally displaced articular fracture. We see a, a very prominent distance between the scaphoid and lunate seen at the preliminary uh, fracture reduction. And fixed with an anterior plate, the gap remains and if we look at the x-ray of the opposite side, it's quite a bit different. So that takes us back to the question, is this a real lesion or uh, something other than a true complete ligamentous tear? Notice that 44 week follow-up, the interval is, appears to be substantially less. The fracture reduction appears to be nearly anatomic uh, and um, with the exception of slight extension of the lunate, the alignment of the scapha lunate is uh, within normal limits. And the follow-up from 44 weeks to 239 weeks shows no pain in follow-up and very modest functional limitation. We follow this up at our own center, looking at a two-year follow-up of fractures with uh, articular involvement of the distal radius and wide scapha lunate interval. And using CT scan, we found that there was a disruption of the dorsal uh, intercarpal ligament uh, problems on the carpus, but not true scapha lunate ligament disruption. So in, in this uh, situation, we found that there is very little suggestion that these are true scaphalunate ligament injuries. We know that bilateral imaging is very important before initiating surgery. And there's a very strong support to suggest that these are not true scaphalunate ligament complete tears. A number of other articles have looked at this carefully. Uh, go back one. And I, I draw, I draw, no, one more. Uh, advance, advance. I draw your attention to the, uh, the article that looks at a, a 13 to 15 year follow up uh, of intraarticular distal radius fractures. And um, they suggested that there were scapha lunate ligament injuries, but not complete tears. And they found that there was no difference in the outcome between the injured side and the opposite side. Again, supporting this idea that perhaps these are not true scapha lunate ligament injuries when associated with an intraarticular fracture.